So as I said, we've been looking at the red letters of Jesus throughout uh, this summer, those red letters in your Bible that, you know, refer to Jesus speaking. We're looking at 10 of the most popular themes that Jesus spoke about, and when you take all of these themes and you put them all together, you actually get a pretty good picture of, you know, the things that were really on the heart of Christ. And uh, that's kind of what we're doing, and I hope that you will take the time and sort of reflect on the things that we've talked about this summer and sort of put it all together and get this image of Jesus. Remember, Jesus is God in human form. Like the Apostle John said, the Word became flesh. And so these red letters, they're coming not just from Jesus, but Jesus is God. This is God speaking to us. And so it's a privilege for us to be able to look into the mind of God. You know, for centuries, people wanted to know what God was like. Who is God? What, is he, what, is, what does He think? What does He want from me? And here in the person of Jesus, we have God in human form telling us how he thinks and what's important. And so we have this perfect human rendering in Christ, and we need to try to understand what he is saying. Today we're going to look at an area that was very close to Jesus' heart. And by Jesus' heart, we mean God's heart. And here's the statement today. The statement is, be gracious. Be gracious. Now, this word grace that we here so often in the church, is uh, the Greek word charis, which is actually the name of our fellowship. We actually uh, changed the working name of our fellowship a few years ago from the Fellowship of Grace Brethren Churches to charis, uh, which is the same word in Greek. In its most root sense, the word charis means to be favorably inclined towards someone. Favorably inclined towards someone. That you just have this sort of positive, wanting to bless sort of approach toward people. Let me ask you this question. Um, have you ever had someone who had to tell you something really hard about yourself, not something that you were wanting to hear, but as they did that, you felt completely loved and accepted at the same time? Have you ever had that happen? Some of you are like, nope, that's never happened in my life. Um, some of you maybe it has, and you might have to think pretty hard to come up with that time, but a time when someone had to tell you something really hard, but as they delivered that, they just had a way about them that made you accept it. It's almost like, you know, they're sticking this knife in your heart, and you're just kind of saying, yeah, I just needed that, right? You know, like, you're just, you're taking it because of the, the way that they're doing it. You know, that's kind of what we're talking about in many ways, this word grace. It's, it's this ability to have this winsome quality this favorable disposition toward people. Often in our Bible, it's translated as the word kindness, which lacks some of the nuance of the word, but, you know, that idea is certainly there as well. The Apostle John, years after Jesus left, thought back, and as he's recording things about Jesus' life in the books that he wrote and that got recorded in our New Testament, he mentions that Jesus is the one who is full of grace and truth. Twice in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, he mentions this. That Jesus was full of grace and truth. And so it was a very striking aspect of Jesus' person. When Jesus began his ministry, he, being a rabbi, went around and visited different synagogues, and he would open the Scriptures. This was the standard procedure. He would open the Scripture, read from it, and then would begin to expound it uh, with the people that were listening. And in Luke chapter 4, look what it says. It says, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? So even at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, when he would go around and he would visit these, you know, temple courts or synagogues, and he would open the scripture and speak, the people recognized the gracious way that Jesus had about him. Now, this wasn't to say that Jesus didn't ever speak with an edge or that he didn't ever offend people. Don't get that idea. In fact, if you were to read on here in chapter 4, you would see before the chapter is even over, um, some of the Jewish leaders are literally trying to push him off of a cliff. Literally. Like, I'm not, this is not hyperbole or, you know, th this is literally what they were trying to do. So, he had a way of saying some things that could also, you know, offend people. So, when we're talking about graciousness, we need to be clear. Because sometimes we get this idea that it's all just sort of soft and mushy. But here's the first thing. We're not talking about avoidance. Some people, this is their idea of being gracious. They're just like, I'll never ever mention when someone's doing something wrong. I'll never, you know, I'll just be, you know, I'll just overlook all of that. I'll just be kind of 
avoiding all of that sort of confrontation. Some people appear to be gracious, but in truth, they're really just chicken. They just don't want to, you know, go there and confront people and deal with the emotional fallout of what could happen. They never say hard words because they want to be liked. And the truth is that this is not grace, this is actually weakness. We don't want to be weak, all right? So this is the first thing. The second thing here is that we're not talking about never offending people. Sometimes people need to be offended. That's just the truth. Many times when Jesus was finished speaking, his own disciples walked away stunned. Jesus meets with a rich young man, and the passage says he actually felt love for him, but then he said something that the guy just was like, what? And, and he walked away sad. Often when people would follow Jesus, even those that were his first disciples, followed him around the countryside when he taught on something difficult, they gave up and they walked away. And so when we're talking about grace, we're not talking about never offending people. We can see that graciousness is not, fearless, is not fearfulness or weakness. In fact, grace might be one of the greatest indications of profound character that exists. Take note of this. If a person is able to be gracious, it really says something about their character. Because grace is a hard thing to exercise. But if you can, if you can master this, wow, it really says something about your character. Because it takes amazing strength of character and self-assurance to say hard things to people while at the same time leaving them no doubt that you love them and that you really want the best for them. If you can manage that at home, in your place of business, with your friends, if you can manage that, wow, you are becoming a very mature person. And this is the exact type of thing that we see in John chapter 8. I want you to turn there this morning. This is a story that we've all heard about. John chapter 8. Take a second and turn there in your Bible or look on your device. John is actually the only gospel writer who mentions this story. Some translations actually question whether or not it was in the original a copy of John's letter, but few people question that it happened. It, it is the story of the woman caught in adultery. And so let's take a, a look at it here from verse 1 to 11. It says, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Then they kept on questioning him, or when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Now, I'm not going to do a full exegesis of this passage today. There are certainly many questions that jump to mind when you read this story. Uh, one of them, obviously, being, how do you catch a woman in adultery and not the man that she was doing this with? Right? But uh, women in the room are probably saying, we're used to this. This is kind of par for the course <laughs> when it comes to uh, women. There's never kind of been a level playing field in many respects. And certainly, this is true in this story as well. But this is a very tense moment. Everybody is watching. The teachers of the law and Pharisees are pretty confident that they have devised the perfect trap to catch Jesus, right? They've found the perfect situation, the perfect question to ask, and they're going to nail him here. They're going to put him in a situation where no matter which way he answers, he's going to lose popularity. Think about this for a second. If he sides with the law, he has to stone the woman, and that's not going to make him very popular. And if he sides with the woman, he'll be ignoring the law of Moses, which is not good either because all of the Jews respected the law of Moses. So he's between a rock and a hard place here. The well-being of the woman isn't even a concern for these Jewish leaders. They don't care about the woman. They're just using her as a pawn in this situation to try to condemn Jesus. They have no you know, consideration for her feelings or her well-being whatsoever. And Jesus needs to deal truthfully with the situation. 
And it's one thing to deal with something truthfully, but it's another thing to be able to deal with it truthfully and at the same time to bring grace into the situation and to deal with it graciously. Like John said, he was full of grace and truth together. And this is such a hard thing to do. Now, I would love to know what he wrote in the sand. Wouldn't you love to know? This is one of the questions when we get to heaven someday. What did you write in the sand there? What did you write? You know, we all have sort of thoughts about what he might have written. Maybe he was writing the sins of some of those people present, right? Embezzler, and then he looks up, right? Cheater looks up, right? And he's, maybe he's writing the, their sins in the sand. Maybe uh, they were secrets. Maybe there were things that, you know, nobody knew. And when Jesus looked them in the eye, they're like, oh, he knows, right? Maybe, maybe, maybe he even drew arrows, right? So he writes the word cheater, and then he goes, right? I don't know, maybe. But whatever he wrote in the sand, it was, it worked, and then he issues a challenge. He says, let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he writes some more. And maybe someone started to pick up a stone. Maybe they thought, you know, yeah, I still feel, you know, self-righteous enough to be the one to do it. And then maybe when he wrote the second time, he wrote a special word just for that person. I don't know. But he wrote again in the sand. When he did that, the crowd started to scatter. Now, we see grace in a couple of big ways here in this story. The first way is this, is that he did not give these Jews what they deserved. You see, fairness, and fairness, we judge fairness by equality, that would have involved Jesus dragging these guys one by one in front of everyone and verbalizing their shameful deeds in front of them. Can you imagine if he had done that? All right, step aside, adulterous woman, for a second. Let's give the floor to Bob over here, whatever his name is. Come on up, right? guess what Bob's done, right? And then get the whole crowd after Bob, right? Like, he could have done that if he wanted to. Then he would have been treated, uh, they would have been treated the same way as the woman. But Jesus instead chooses to write in the dirt. He finds a way to address their sins in a way that brings the least shame. In other words, he gave them a gift. He was really giving them a gift here by writing in the sand. Do you know the word charis, this word grace, is often also translated as gift? That's what he was doing here. He was acting in grace. He was giving them favor that they did not deserve. And it says then that the men started leaving one at a time. Did you notice it says the older ones first? Did you catch that? You know, it's interesting. The apostle Peter tells us to grow in grace in 2 Peter chapter 3 grow in grace. In other words, this grace thing is not something you're born with. It's not something that comes naturally. It's something you have to work at, and over time, you develop the ability to act graciously. And so I want to, you know, kind of highlight that here. When we've lived a little longer, you know, I think what happens is we come to know the depth of our own depravity. The longer you live, the more you recognize your own sinfulness and your inability to hide it. Hopefully that happens. I think that that is something that builds grace in a person. And I want to warn those of you who are younger, younger people. Up until now, you've likely been taught more about the law, about the rules, than you have been about grace. You've learned what is true, and that is good. But it's only half of the equation. You need to have grace and truth together. You need to start growing in grace. Think about it. Truth alone will not make the world a better place. It won't. Because what happens is truth is like light. You shine it on everybody and you just see we're all sinful. So truth alone is not going to fix our world. Grace has to be added to it. You know, Gandhi wasn't a Christian, but he was a great admirer of the teachings of Jesus. And he pointed out that an eye for an eye mentality will eventually leave the whole world blind, right? If you're always just trying to even the score with somebody, the whole world's going to go blind because in a sinful world, you're never going to even the score. It's never going to happen. Truth is not enough to fix our world. We need grace with it. When we're young and passionate about truth, everything is about who is right in this situation. Who's right? But I'm telling you, it's an immature way of seeing the world. Let me give you a tip. The next time that you are so hungry for truth, ask yourself the question, right? Why do you really care so much? Do, do a little heart check. 
why do you really care so much? Because here's what you'll usually find out. If you really are open to the Holy Spirit showing you the condition of your own heart, usually you realize that your own ego is involved, right? You just like to appear right, kind of like the Pharisees. Or you maybe like being in control, right? Truth for you is a way of being in control. You know what's right, right? You try to appear like you're doing what's right, and you look like you're on the right side of things, and you're in control, and those that don't measure up, right? Often there is this selfish sort of pride mixed in to our motivations when we're so hungry for truth. But when you really care about someone, you want to use the least amount of power and control possible to get them to change. Those of you who are parents, you know this, that in your parenting, you don't want to be coming down heavy on your kids. You want them to do the right thing, but you're trying to get them to do it with the least amount of force and coercion because you love them. You're not wanting to, you know, beat them up or make their life miserable. You want them to have a good life, but you have to steer them in the right direction. Sometimes that requires a lot of thought and creativity, right? Lazy parenting often is very legalistic. It's like, ah, it's all black and white, do this. If you don't, consequence, right? Like, it's, it can be very black and white. But Jesus was creative. Did you notice how creative he was in this situation? He wrote on the ground, and what could have become a very angry and violent mob dissipated quietly and peacefully. Now, after pastoring for almost 30 years, do you know how I spot maturity? Because there's a lot of times where I need to spot it. I'm looking for, for people to step into certain positions, to do certain things, and I need someone who's mature in that place. I can't, I can't have somebody that's not going to be mature. So when I'm looking for it, do you know what I look for? I spot the person who is able to get people on side with the least amount of force and the least amount of drama. That's what I'm looking for. See, some people can, they can coerce people with a lot of force and drama, and, but I, I'm looking for that person that just has a way about them, that graciousness that can get people on side and working together without all the drama, without all of the fighting. Now, Jesus didn't need to use force or drama here. Now, of course, there's a second way that he shows grace in this story. He gives the Jews, you know, more than they deserve. And secondly, he doesn't give the woman what she deserved either. The fact is, under the law, adultery deserved to be, uh, to be punished. And the fact that the man wasn't pulled in before everybody doesn't change the fact that the woman here deserved some kind of consequence for her actions. She was guilty. But Jesus, being the wise one that he is, he took assessment of the situation, and he realized this woman has already been shamed for her sin. She's been dragged out here into the dirt, thrown into the middle of this court where everybody is looking at her. Everyone's made aware of her sin. The threat of punishment looms over her, maybe even death. And so moving forward, instead of trying to control her externally with the law or punishment, Jesus chose to motivate her internally with grace and kindness. Now, parents, I want to address you again here. Many of us need to get better at using grace in our parenting. Some parents only ever use the law. And when you only ever use the law, your kids start to wonder if you're actually human. Say, man, do you ever break a rule? Do you ever struggle with anything? But when it's just the law all the time, you're always coming down heavy. They start to wonder if you're human and your relationship is going to suffer. Some of us act like pushovers all of the time. We're not, you know, we don't want to be the heavy, right? So we just let them do whatever. Yeah, just do whatever. Free for all. Guys, that's not grace either. That's not what God's looking for in our parenting. You know, but when you make a general pattern of enforcing rules... What happens is that it gives you the opportunity to act in grace every once in a while and to surprise them in grace. And this is an amazing thing. As a parent, you will come across times when giving a punishment for something isn't the best option. Every once in a while, surprising them with grace will get deeper into their heart and change the way that they think and act. I remember when... Um, my kids were very young. We still lived back in Levi Creek. My son, Jacob, was playing with one of my golf clubs. And I think he was probably only five or six at the time. And I kind of warned him. I said, you know, keep away from the house if you're going to swing that golf club. I don't know what iron. It was like a five iron or something, but he was swinging it. 
And uh, the next thing I knew, whoosh, right through the front window, right? And I could have lost it, but part of me was like, wow, that was a pretty good shot, right? He actually got that ball in the air. That's not, that's not easy to do, right? Um, and I, more than anything, I think the way it happened is I wasn't actually there at the time, and I think my wife, I still have the picture somewhere, my wife sent me the picture. It was a great picture because it was taken from inside the house with the hole in the window, and as you looked out through the window, you could see Jacob there with his sister, and his head was just like this, right? Just hanging down. Like he knew it was not going to be good, right? And I think when I saw that picture, I realized, hmm, I could deal with him with the law. He deserves it. But I thought, no, not today. And that was just kind of a, one of those moments where you realize sometimes there are natural consequences that kind of serve as the punishment. You see, Jesus, he saw that this woman had already been broken. The prophet Isaiah prophesied that when the Messiah, Jesus, would come, that a bruised reed he would not break. It's sort of this cryptic ancient language, but it, what it's saying was that this Messiah, Jesus, was going to be gracious. When he saw someone who was already broken, he didn't just crush them and rub them out in the dirt. He lifted them back up. This is the nature of God. He considers the state of the person. When I was a teenager, uh, I remember one time when I needed a lot of grace. Uh, I was dating this girl, and I went to visit her in the valley, which was probably an hour, an hour and a half from where I lived. And I was driving my brother's car. He had just gotten a car. I don't even think he had driven it yet because dad picked it up. He got it for like two or 300 bucks. It was this great big old Buick. And uh, I was like, oh, I would really like to go visit my girlfriend. My brother was away somewhere. And I said, do you think I could take his car? So dad was probably like, well, yeah, I guess so. So I took his car. And sure enough, I came to this what I thought was a four-way stop, it was only a two-way stop. So I stopped, and then I just kept going, not realizing this guy did not need to stop that was coming the other way. And by the time I realized it and gunned it to try to get through, he hit right behind my door, spun the car right around 360. It knocked the lenses right out of my glasses that I was wearing. But no one was hurt. And um, I remember, you know, going to my brother saying, oh, your new car, by the way? Um, yeah, sorry. My dad had to change insurance companies. They wouldn't insure him anymore because uh, he now had a high-risk son on his, you know, on his policy. And I just remember waiting for my dad and his reaction because my dad could be explosive about these things, and I was waiting for it. I was bracing myself with the phone call, Dad. But he actually said, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm good. Everyone's okay? Yeah. All right. We'll deal with it when you get home. Right? And I just remember feeling that grace in that moment. We all have moments like that. And when we remember these moments, we're like, wow, grace really is powerful. When you give people grace and mercy, you surprise them. And that's what Jesus did here. He says, where are these people? Has no one condemned you? No one, she said. So Jesus says, go and leave your life of sin. You know, I wonder, how is it that Christians have become known for being so judgmental and so merciless? You guys understand that we're like a meme, right? Christians are basically compared to being judgmental, merciless people. We're like Angela in the office. You know, you understand, if you watch The Office, they made Angela the Christian character. She is the most merciless, judgmental person on the show, who is also probably the most flawed person on the show, who does sin above and beyond what anyone else in The Office is doing. That is how we're portrayed. And I'm not sure if it's completely, completely accurate, but... It, it kind of makes you wonder, how do Christians who are taught by Jesus to be gracious and to be merciful, how is it that we become this? How do we become known this way? You know, it's natural for everyone to act this way, you know, to point out other people's faults, to be self-righteous, 
to be full of ourselves. It's natural for everyone to do that, but it's worse for Christians, and here's the reason why. Because as Christians, from the time that we're young, we're taught the truth. (laughs) You see, so if you want to be self-righteous and you know the truth, it gives you kind of like a weapon. You can weaponize it. You can go around cutting everybody down because you know the truth. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians do this, but what they never learn is that truth was always supposed to be balanced with grace. You know, it's fallen human nature for everyone to try to make others look bad and for, to make ourselves look good, Christian or non-Christian. Everybody, by nature, tries to do this. It starts when we're young on the playground. It continues all through school. It goes into our careers. That one-upmanship, it's going on all the time. But Jesus taught us otherwise. He taught us the way of grace. And I want you to see it in Matthew chapter 7. Flip over there for a second. Matthew chapter 7, in the first five verses. Jesus said, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all of the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, verse 2 here in this passage is often interpreted to mean that whatever measure you use, that's what God will use when He measures you someday, you know, at the judgment. And a lot of people have understood it this way, but I really think the most natural understanding here is simply that when you use stringent standards on other people, if that's how you become known, guess how they're going to treat you? That's human nature. If you're going to judge me hard, guess what? I'm going to judge you hard too. And it just starts this sort of negative competition where we're just eating one another alive. Everyone loves to see a self-righteous person get what's coming to them. That's why Angela in the office is, you know, such an entertaining character because you, you see this coming back on her, this self-righteous attitude. Jesus said that his followers were to be people of introspection. That's basically what he's saying here when he teaches us that we're to take the plank out of our own eye before we critique the speck that is in somebody else's eye. We are supposed to be people of introspection. We are supposed to look in the mirror. James, who is the brother of Jesus, used the exact same analogy of looking in the mirror and doing nothing about it. We are supposed to be people of introspection. In other words, we examine our own lives and our own hearts and our own motives before we start, you know, looking to other people. You know, as a pastor, I'm often in a role that requires me to address the specks in people's eyes. That's part of what my job entails. And the Apostle Paul warned teachers like me to be very, very careful because pride can creep in really quickly when you're helping other people to fix things in their life. You can very quickly start thinking, yeah, I've got it all together, right? And I can attest it takes a lot of self-control and a lot of humility to help people with their sinful issues. As Christians, remember this, we are called to consider our own sinfulness whenever we are helping someone else. Always consider your own sinfulness. Some people have a very hard time with this. Sometimes it's a personality thing, I think. I think some of us are just more justice-oriented by nature. And there's good to that, but you have to be really careful. You know, as a... Yeah, just think about this. One, One of the big differences between us and Jesus is that John said that Jesus could see what was in a person. Think about that. Like sometimes we lack empathy because we we have a hard time putting ourselves in someone else's shoes. But Jesus never had a problem with that because he's God. And so, like it says in John chapter 2, Jesus didn't have to wonder what was going on in a person. He knew the heart of the person. And so knowing that, I think it helped Jesus to be able to balance grace and truth because he loved that person and he knows what they've experienced. He knows their whole history. He knows what's going on in their heart. But we don't. And so, guys, we have to work a whole lot harder at empathizing, at trying to know what's going on in a person. And very often, we don't. We just see what's going on on the outside, and we judge that, and we come down hard on it. We take no consideration for any of the backstory, any of the emotion, any of the experience of that person. You know, God did a real work on me as a young adult. When I was a kid, because I was raised in the church, um, as a kid, I became quite a Pharisee. I really was. If you'd have known me when I was young, 
boy, I was, a, I was a pretty good Pharisee. I knew the truth, but for me, it became like a weapon, right? Like, I knew I'm doing the right thing. Why aren't you doing the right thing? And it, there was a lot of pride wrapped up in it. I was pretty self-righteous. I had a pretty high view of myself when I was a kid. But God got a hold of my heart. He actually used my younger brother to change me because my, my younger brother was the rebel in the family. And, you know, at first it was kind of fun to kind of just be like the good kid and he's the rebel kid. But over time, it's like I wanted to have a relationship with him. And I recognized that, you know, me judging him was not going to ever let me have a relationship. The more I did that, he just went farther away. And I'm like, I'm not even going to have any friendship with him. And so I decided that I wanted him in my life more than I wanted to just be right. And it was a really good lesson. You see, what I've come to understand is that people are all the same. We all do the things that we do for love and acceptance. That's pretty much it. Anytime you see people doing stuff, you can boil it down. You can understand they're doing this for love and acceptance. The way that that plays out changes with everybody, depending on their personality and the scenario, but they're all looking for love and acceptance. We're all the same. And given the same circumstances, we all pretty much do the same things. You see a certain person that's arrived at a certain place in their life. If you understood all of the things that they went through, all of the forces at play in their life that brought them to where they are today, if you were to run the same scenario on you, if you had started it in the same place as them, you know what? You would be in the same place as them. Probably 99.5% of the time. I'm convinced of it. Because we all want the same things. And if you don't believe that yet, you probably suck at empathizing. I'm just telling you. You're probably really, really bad at it. Because somewhere, and here's the truth, if you aren't at that point yet of realizing that we're all pretty much the same, we would all pretty much do the same things given the same conditions, if you still don't believe that, you still believe somewhere deep down inside that you are just better than somebody else. You say, no, but analyze it closer. Yeah. You think that you're fundamentally better than somebody else but you're not. And someday you're going to wake up to this truth. And it might require falling hard and seeing your own sinfulness in new ways. And I don't wish that on you, but if that's what it takes for you to become a gracious person, God's open to that. And so embrace it. Jesus taught us that our job is to love people, not judge them. Yes, we always discern what is right and wrong in every situation. That's not what it means when it says not to judge people. You should be able to see the actions that people are doing and decide in your mind if that's good or bad, if that's something that you should pursue or not. You should know what's right and wrong and live for the good. To judge in this context is talking about this attitude of superiority and of condemnation. And Jesus hated it. He hated it. He did not come to condemn the world. The world was already condemned. He came to bring salvation to mankind. The solution was to love people. Sarah and I were downtown in Toronto last week with a friend, and uh, we were going to a show. And we went to a restaurant beforehand. And it was in, how would I say it, a very diverse part of the city. Could I say it that way? Um, in all different ways. And as we were going into the restaurant, they had a letter board. You know, the one that you, you, you stick the little white letters on. They had a letter board there, and it was something that I'm sure they change every day or every week. And the statement on the board was this, love absolutely everyone, I'll sort it out later, God. And as we going in there, as Christian people, looking at the sign, saw it, we, we kind of smiled and said, that's pretty good. It's pretty good, right? Love absolutely everyone. Regardless of the differences that you have with them, that's, your, your job is to love them. Love them. And God says, I'll sort it out later, right? Because sometimes we get worried, wow, if I, if I show love to somebody that God's not approving of in some way, is that going to come down on me? No, God says, love everybody. He'll sort it out. I thought it was pretty good. You know, Jesus knew that some of us are slow to grasp this concept That love is the only thing that really changes people from the inside out. It is. You, you may be trying still to change people in your life. You're trying to control them, coerce them, manipulate them, do stuff, you know, backhanded that they don't understand, right? All of this mental game and everything. Give it up. Forget it. It doesn't work. The only thing that really changes people from the inside out is love. 
Because if they're really going to change, it has to come from inside of them, and love will do that. Grace will do that to people. Love compels us to act favorably toward people and to give them more than they, they deserve because God has given us more than we deserve, and that's what we call grace. In John chapter 7, verse 12, it says, So in everything you do, do to others as you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. A few years ago, a friend of mine from down east where I grew up contacted me. We had been roommates in college. And he was coming to Toronto on a business trip, and he said, hey, let's get together over by the airport. And I'm like, that would be awesome. I hadn't seen this guy in years. So we got together. We went to the little Swiss chalet over by the airport, and uh, we're sitting there, and we're talking. And I had known that this friend had been posting a lot of stuff on Facebook, and a lot of really self-deprecating stuff, just kind of putting himself down. And it was subtle, but I, I, I could catch it. Like it, it, it was subtle, but not that subtle. And I had been following this for a number of months and seeing him writing this. His life wasn't on the trajectory that he had hoped. He had had some, some you know, disappointments and failures on his part in his life. And his dad, I knew his dad, his dad had always been very judgmental. He was very difficult to please. And I knew that from the time this guy was young, it made his life very difficult to have his dad being like that. And even at that time, his dad, who was a spiritual leader, actually, was constantly bringing sort of the spirit of condemnation on this guy. And I knew it because I knew the family and I could see and from what he was telling me. And even as we were there in Swiss Chalet, we started talking about it. And um, I, I just kind of empathized with him. I said, man, you, you've got to get beyond this. And I, I said, you know, I, I really feel like God's telling me to tell you, you need to let go of this. You're done with it. We were both crying in the Swiss chalet. The waiter comes over and we're just like, Ugh, right? But it was a very emotional meeting. And I said, you know what? Listen, you know, I know what's going on here, but none of us is any better. And if you had grown up the way that your dad did, you'd probably be the same way. And so I gave him a little bit of advice. I said, listen, why don't you try, whenever he brings you down, why don't you just go up and just give him a hug and say, I love you, Dad. I said, just try it. Sometimes stuff like that works. Like it just kind of breaks through all of the stuff. My suspicion was that his dad lacked unconditional love as a kid. And I'm not sure if he tried my advice, but I've followed up with him over the years since then. And his relationship, the last time I spoke with him, his relationship with his dad was going really well. I don't know if he used that advice or not, but I'm sure somewhere in the equation he brought grace into it. I'm sure, because that's what grace does. I know that grace is one of the most beautiful concepts that you'll ever encounter. It separates Jesus from all other religious teachers. Think about this. Many faiths claim to know the truth, right? Many faiths preach justice. Many faiths teach some form of karma, that, you know, you're going to get what's coming to you. But Christian faith teaches that there's something more powerful than all of these things, and it's grace. Think about it. It's more powerful than truth and justice. Truth never changed anybody. It's more powerful than karma. Karma says you always get what's coming to you. Grace says sometimes, because of the goodness of people or God, you don't actually get what's coming to you. That's better that's grace. It's incredible. Grace says that when you give some, someone favor that they don't deserve, it unleashes power that can literally change someone's life. And Jesus said we should use it more. Be gracious. Let's pray.